I'm here with my friend, Lisa Good Crawford. Lisa and I have known each other for a very long time and have sort of played tag team for, for many, many years. It's a great pleasure to see her. Lisa is uh, now teaches harpsichord at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, but she continues to live in Oberlin where for many, many years, she was professor of harpsichord and a participant in the, in the, in the performance institute that's so famous that so many people in this series are, have been associated with. So I'm really happy to see my friend, Lisa. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Tom. <laughs> How are you? Um, there you are in your music room with your harpsichord. Um, uh, I think it was from you that I first heard the term early music. And I remember thinking, oh, what an interesting concept because we who had been trained in music learned about the periods in music history. You know, you have medieval and Renaissance and Baroque and classical and romantic and all that stuff. But I'd never heard the term early music as sort of a larger concept. Um, and that was a long time ago. Could you say a little something about how you got started in music and um, when the concept of early music occurred to you? Sure. Um, well, I, I was a pianist in high school, um, but I was also interested in a lot of other things besides music. And I only liked to play Bach on piano. So, um, so I decided that rather than apply to conservatories, I would uh, apply to a university instead for liberal arts. And I went to Radcliffe. Um, I, when I got in to Radcliffe, I said, okay, well, that means I'm not going into music <laughs> because I didn't go to a conservatory and that's how it works. So at, at Harvard, my, my first year, I started out taking piano lessons at Longy School of Music because you couldn't get credit for taking lessons anyway. Uh, uh, at, uh, if you were at Harvard, it, it wasn't considered something that was credit worthy. But anyway, in the spring semester, that was fine. But in the spring semester, I saw a little sign that said harpsichord lessons. I was uh, on, the, on the bulletin board at the music building. And David Fuller was teaching. Uh, he was a grad student at that point. So anyway, I started harpsichord lessons and within two weeks I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, at the same time, I was just starting a music major at Harvard. So I was about to take the mu famous music 123, I think, and 124, with, but 123 with John Ward, which was about early music. I mean, so I got introduced to the instrument and the repertoire and the whole idea of performing from that music from that time, all kind of at the same time. And that was in the 60s, the early 60s. So it was also the same time that harpsichords were being made by Frank Hubbard and Bill Dowd uh, se in separate shops by then. They had been together, but, but when I met them, they, they definitely had se separate shops. So I spent my whole undergraduate time kind of in a sort of like in a toy shop of, of knowing things about early music. I don't remember where that, when that term cropped up. I really don't. Uh, I, you know, I went to um, um, New York Pro Music concerts and Sanders Theater. Um, I had recordings such as they were then and, and play them all the time. I don't, and I guess I thought of what we were all doing was early music, but I, I, I actually don't remember where the words come from. I mean, when. So uh, interesting that you, uh, that you started sort of just at the time the whole harpsichord thing started. I mean, there weren't, uh, with the possible exception maybe of Arnold Dolmetsch's funny experiments in Boston, there was hardly any attempt to make his uh, harpsichords along historical lines before Hubbard and Dowd started doing that, right? Now, I don't know where David Fuller figured out how to play the harpsichord, but there were not many harpsichord teachers of the sort of historical harpsichord kind right. before he came along, were there? 
Um, in Boston, not well, no, in general, not. Um, I was just very lucky. I, I remember <laughs> I remember coming back from Ann Arbor. I lived in Ann Arbor. Um, so summers I would go home for vacation. So when I was completely immersed in the harpsichord, I needed a place to practice. And in Ann Arbor, I found a woman who had studied with Ralph Kirkpatrick, who said that I could practice on her instrument, which was a Neupert, I think Bach model. <laughs> so a great big sort of fabric instrument with, you know, high tension strings. And, and it wasn't, I found, I mean, it, any harpsichord to me was great at that point. I, I fell in love with this <laughs> instrument. I came back to Boston. I had found out how much it cost. It wasn't, wasn't all that expensive, actually, this Neupert. Uh, came back to Boston and told David Fuller, who, who said, oh, <laughs> oh my God, you <laughs> must not do that. And he had a doubt, he had a, a, but it did have pedals to change the stops, but, and it was walnut veneer, I believe, uh, you know, two manuals, the sort of standard doubt harpsichord from the early sixties. But I was just so lucky that, because you're right, if I had gone to anybody else in Boston, I don't think they would have had instruments like that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they didn't. And um, yeah, so it it felt very much like being in the middle of something cutting edge um, yeah. because of builders. So where was there for a harpsichordist to go? I mean, after I mean, after four years at Harvard, or Radcliffe as it as it was then called, um, what happens next? So I applied, well, I talked to everybody about what I, you know, ideas for what I should do. Um, Cause I had given a number of recitals as an undergraduate at Harvard. And I, I remember talking after a party at a party after some concert or other, I think I was talking to Jim Weaver or John Vesperman. Um, I know I also talked to Bill Dowd and to my teacher David Fuller, although he wasn't living, he he went to Buffalo to teach, so I was I was without a teacher for the last two years of of undergraduate. Um, but anyway, I you know it was like, what should I do? And they all said, don't go study with Kirkpatrick, um, <laughs> for various reasons. They thought it would be a bad idea, but. It may have been after a Leonhardt concert, actually. It may have been a party after one of his concerts on tour. They said, you know, it might be an interesting experiment to go and work with this guy. So I applied for Fulbright to go stay with Leonhardt, which I got and, and went to Amsterdam for one year. I was engaged while I was there and came back and got married. I didn't stay over there as some people did when they went to study, but I did, I did work with him for the whole year and certainly enough to be profoundly influenced by the way he thought about both the instrument and the music. Um, a huge um, about, not an about face, but it, it was so different from anything I thought about before. You weren't, you were far from the first American to study with Leonhard. I think Jim Weaver had been and others too. Were there other, were there other people there studying with him as far as you know? Well, since we were all individual, we weren't like in a class. Anymore. Right. Yeah. And so it just happened. It was just whether we happened to bump into each other. I know Ton Kopan was studying the same year I was, but I never saw him all year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I, oh, Peter Wolf was there mm -hmm. I think, the same year. Um, I met other, I met instrumentalists. I met Bruce Haynes, who was there that year. Um, who else? There were, there was a Baroque violinist, but yeah, it wasn't a very large number of, of people. And, um, yeah, I, I don't feel as though there was as much 
it was afterwards thinking back on that year that I realized how much I'd been exposed to sort of not while I was there, but, but, but afterwards. Um, yeah. And I went to some concerts of Quadro Amsterdam at, yeah. the, at the time was, um, I guess it was Jaap Schroeder, it was Franz Bruggen, Honor Bailsma and Lanhart. And I think Bruggen was still playing silver flute. Wow. <laughs> and I think that, that the string players had the bows, but not the instruments or something. It was definitely sort of on its way to being more uh, historical performance. I mean, as far as the instruments went. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Lanhart has had such a profound influence on so many people and has for a long time. Do you know how many, I mean, there's no reason you should know because you had, a, a, as people do, a sort of a one-to-one -one relationship with him, but normally how many, how many students would he have coming to see him in a, in a given year? Do you have any idea? I really don't. I mean, mm -hmm. I think this, there is this um, pedagogy archive now, the Gustav Leinhardt pedagogy archive, and there might be something in there about numbers, but my impression is, you know, somewhere around three or four uh -huh. at a time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that also probably went in waves. I mean, as he got more well known, it got kind of crazy, you know, he would come and give a concert somewhere in the States and people would drive from 200 miles away to hear that concert. I mean, he, he became a real, um, yeah, not a, sort of a cult figure. Yeah. 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 I mean, I remember driving up to um, Hanover, New Hampshire, because he was giving, I, I forget if he was inaugurating a harpsichord. I think that's where Dale Carr was. And so probably, yes, he was playing on a harpsichord. And there was also a showing of the movie in which he plays Bach. Um, and I drove up from Boston in our van, which was our first harpsichord moving van, um, with all of the little students I had at Longy, because I was teaching at, at Longy. I didn't have very many students, but they all wanted to come and, and hear Lanhart, and with Sheridan German, who also wanted to come and hear Lanhart. So we all drove up to Hanover and walked into the movie theater where huge picture of Lanhart on this, this close up as Bach. We walk in and in the back row, sitting watching the movie is Lanhart. <laughs> so, I remember when that I remember when that, that movie came out, it's 50, maybe 51 years ago now, or something like that. It's more than 50 years old, hard to believe. I remember when it was reviewed in the New Yorker, and the reviewer apparently had no idea who the guy playing Bach was. He says, uh, the, the role of Bach is played by a long, tall drink of water by the name of Gustav Leonhardt. I thought, well. <laughs> Anyhow, so then what happened to you, Lisa? You were there just for one year and yeah. you came back with, uh, with Rudd. Got married, mm -hmm. was living in, in Boston um, and started doing some things. I met Jan Lyman Silverger and we played together. We also taught at Longy together. Um, she was a wonderful performer on the Viola de Gamba. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Very special person, yeah. very special musician, wonderful musician. Um, and it was kind of, I mean, I had some gigs, but I had no, um, there wasn't, when I think about today and all the people who play Baroque instruments today, and I think about then, I mean, because you had said at the beginning, sort of what's it like now compared to what, yeah. what it was like uh -huh. then. It just, I mean, it was a tiny number of people in this field. So, you know, I played some recitals at the museum and um, and some chamber things. I wasn't yet completely sure what a career path was. And I had no idea actually what a career path was in harpsichord playing at that point. Um, we moved away. We went to Philadelphia for two years for Rudd's job because there was a wonderful experimental school in Philadelphia. Um, I didn't have a network 
in Philadelphia. Uh, but I met the Cunninghams, so um, Ty and Caroline Cunningham, and their, their daughters, including Sarah, who was in high school. Um, we hung out, and the Sumners, mm -hmm. Sarah Sumner and her husband Ted, um, we hung out a lot with them. And I was working behind the, oh, I forgot to say, around there, I got a master's in musicology at, at Harvard. But that was really, yeah, that, and that's when we met. <laughs> I, I remember that. And one thing I really remember and that you made a big uh, influence on, I remember you were saying, I'm in this graduate program, but I do not want a PhD. Right. I'm not here for a PhD. I want a master's degree. I want to learn how to do research. I want to learn how to edit music. I want to learn how to work a library, but I am a harpsichordist. Yeah, I, th I thought that was great. And actually the Harvard Music Department many years later created a master's, uh, a master's program in historical performance using you sort of as a model that there's probably a small number of people in the world who don't want a PhD, but who could profit from the, the graduate training that the Harvard Music Department can provide. So you, you've, left your, you've left your mark. Anyway, well, it's, then, it's this whole idea of scholar performer and where along that line you are. And yeah. um, I wanted to be a performer who was a scholar rather than a scholar who was a performer, whatever that means. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah so that happened. Um, and I had done all the coursework and I think had probably written my master's paper too. Um, but there we were in Philadelphia. Um, I felt very much kind of fish out of water. Um, there just weren't enough people around doing what I wanted to do. So we moved back to Boston after a few years. And then I got uh, the now called, I think it's now called the Radcliffe Institute again. I'm not actually sure it's had so many changes of name. Yeah, it's the, the whole thing is now called the Radcliffe Institute for right. Advanced Study. And right. they continue to have the Radcliffe Fellowships as that's part right. of what they do. Yeah, that's right. Well, Mary Polly Bunting had started this uh, as a as a place where women would get fellowships uh, to kind of give them time uh, to do what they wanted to do mm -hmm. and things that, you know, people needed childcare. We, we, we had a toddler by then. Um, people needed childcare. They needed, you know, household, house cleaning help and they needed a place to work. So, yeah. so this gave women kind of, everybody had a room of her own and it was a kind of community of, of people in Radcliffe Yard who were all working on projects. It was fantastic. It, it, I think the main thing it did was to, cause we're talking 1971, 1972, this beginning of the women's movement. And I think what it did for me was just enormous. It uh, said, you know, what you're doing is worth giving you time to do and um, go on doing it. You know, because it's not clear <laughs> at that time, it wasn't so clear what the you know role models were and and what kind how you would how you would pursue a, a career. So I had two years at the Radcliffe Institute, the Bunting Institute, now the Radcliffe Institute again. Um, and at the end of that came this came this. Uh, I forget if I got a letter from Oberlin. I might have. I, somebody said apply for this harpsichord position at Oberlin Conservatory. And I think if I hadn't been at the Institute, I might not have done it. <laughs> uh -huh. But after being there for two years, I was like, yeah, I, I need to do this. And Rudd was perfectly willing to come along, which is what happened. So I got yeah. the job. And I, by then in Boston, I think the people that that I knew the most and was spending the most time with were people like uh, Lex Silvager and his wife, Jan, um, I guess, and the Dowds and Sheridan German and 
some other people, but when I was going to Oberlin again, they're just like before going to, to work with Lanhard, there's people saying, well, you know, what's it like? What, what are they, the people? So the people in Oberlin who had, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this from all the other Oberlin people, so I don't need to say much about it, but it was the Caldwells who had started the Summer Institute. And it was just this amazing coincidence that, that the Oval professor was also a viola da gama player and collector. His, his wife, uh, Kathy Caldwell, was a uh, cellist and gambist. Uh, Bob Willoughby, the flute professor, had studied on a sabbatical with Franz Bruggen. Mm. David Bow, one of the organ teachers, had studied on a sabbatical with Landhart. Um, who else? That's a lot. <laughs> it, it meant that all of a sudden there were Baroque instruments being thought about at Oberlin. And in the context of uh, teachers who had studios full of really good students who were, you know, modern students, but who were there uh, and who might get interested in doing uh, something with a Baroque instrument. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was leaving Boston, which was this big cosmopolitan place, lots going on and going to this tiny town in Ohio <laughs> where there was one thing going on. Uh -huh. And, and yeah, so I, yeah, I had actually those first years teaching at Oberlin are kind of a blur because I had you know, I, I'd never even worked full time before, and this was interesting. I mean, I, at, at that time, I wonder uh, where, besides maybe Albert Fuller at Juilliard, where yeah. where there was harpsichord instruction at all in in America's major conservatories, hmm. and oh, did, how did you manage to fill up a studio? There couldn't have been that many people in the world, forgive me, who wanted to play the harpsichord. As um, and since Oberlin's an undergraduate, as undergraduates, right? In yeah. high school, right. right? Right. Well, there were just a few. I mean, it's a, a small, and it's still a small applicant pool. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a really interesting thing to see. But my impression is that it went over, over the last forty or fifty years that, that I've looked at it. I mean, taking some time off uh, between Oberlin and Eastman, um, is that you know the waves would go up to like a studio of 10 majors, I think is the most I ever had in my life. And that mostly it would be four or five. And we're talking all the classes, not just entering class, but right. yeah, yeah. Studio. Five, five in the whole conservatory. Studio, four or five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that was majors. And I mean, I think I, I had to make a case a number of times that it didn't make sense to have a whole 16 people studying harpsichord because what were they going to do then? I mean, I know you can say that about a lot of things, a lot of <laughs> instruments as well, but, but it made sense to me that there would be a small number of specialists and that then there would be a larger number of other keyboard players who would study harpsichord as secondary study. And that's what happened. I mean, mm -hmm. I had like this huge number of of students in the studio, uh, uh, most the majority of them were secondary yeah. students. There was also the ensemble program, and since I was the one with the full time job in, well, in in harpsichord. So that's the other thing. It started out as an outgrowth of the organ department. It was the organist who created that position. Mm. So when I came, I was I was really kind of an adjunct to the organists. And there, were, when I came, there wasn't any historical performance program the way there is now. There, there was a small early music committee, I think, <laughs> and it had the Caldwells and David Bow and and Bob Willoughby, the people who were interested in it. But it was cross departmental. And so was, uh, the students you have, did you? Uh, uh, harpsichord majors were admitted to the conservatory as harpsichord majors, right? But yeah. did you have people who 
who sort of converted to the harpsichord from either organ or piano in the course of their undergraduate oh. time and went on to, to, to be historical performance people? Yes, I mean, the, the one that comes to mind is Kenny Weiss, um, who was a brilliant piano student, you know, had come in with the top rating as a, as a pianist, and he got completely hooked on the harpsichord and, um, yeah, and switched and became a harpsichord major. I'm trying to remember if others um, went that route. Uh, organists more, um, organists who would add it in a serious way. I mean, they wouldn't stop playing the organ. Right. But they would become serious harpsichordists as well. There's a lot of those, actually. That's one of the one of the areas for discussion, isn't it? Is whether whether it's appropriate to play a modern and a historical instrument at the same time, be a kind of a switch hitter, um, or to specialize in one particular thing. That's true very often for the wind players and the string players, a, a question that they face, but also I presume a question that players of historical keyboards play uh, face also. I mean to double kind of yeah yeah I, it, it, it's strange because it doesn't seem as it doesn't I, I don't know why it doesn't seem totally parallel to me but i can't no i agree it. somehow organ and harpsichord go together yeah. in a way not yeah, so much piano and harpsichord maybe right exactly yeah. and yeah. and partly because or because harpsichord is were organists yes i mean there weren't many people in the 17th and 18th century who were harpsichordists without being organists. Now there are, but yeah. um, so that seems more natural. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the, one of the things that we seem to be noticing that's different in the early music or historical performance world nowadays is that back in the day, people had to sort of figure it out for themselves. You at least did have David Fuller to help you along, but there are so many people who didn't know how to keep their Baroque violin from squeaking or didn't know how to play their oboe in tune or whatever it was, and didn't have anybody to tell them and spent a lot of time reading treatises and that kind of thing. Now you've spent a lot of time also looking at original sources of music. I know that you've sort of, it seemed maybe I overstate the case, but I think of you as among other things, a specialist in French Baroque music. You've actually edited some stuff and I've heard you play some stuff that I had never heard of before. So say a little bit about the, the scholarly French side of your stuff. Well, part of that goes back to David Fuller because that's, he's the one he, who was the sort of first uh, musicologist to spend lots and lots of time on, on uh, 17th and 18th especially 18th century French harpsichord music. So that when I was an undergraduate, I mean, he, he was just a great person to introduce me to French style. And which is something that takes a lot of um, initiation. I mean, it's, it's a difficult style, but once you, once you know it, it's, you can just stay there forever. Um, and I think, I don't know, I think, I'm now remembering, it could have been 1978 um, at BPI, at the Baroque Institute, we did French music and I wanted us to be doing repertoire that people didn't necessarily know. So I went to visit David in Buffalo and I read through tons of, he had photocopies of every single harpsichord publication, 18th century publication and, and more. Um, I don't think he had a copy of the Boheme manuscript, but, mm. um, but anyway, it was mostly prints I was looking at. But I remember reading through these and names that I didn't know at all and thinking, wow, I found a couple of people that were extremely interesting. Uh, Nicolas Siré uh, and and uh, Pancras Royer, who oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. one that, and his Royer's pieces just totally hooked me. I mean, they were so dramatic and they used the instruments so well. 
So I played some of them in, oh, so what we did was we gave the BPI harpsichord students in the class a little, little book that was a compilation of, of good pieces from the original prints, not too hard to read, except there were clefs, but, mm. <laughs> but it was beautifully printed um, for a number of composers. And also they could do any of the, the composers that, for whom there were modern editions as well. But nobody, nobody bit, nobody, nobody, nobody tried those. And I thought, okay, I think I should give a concert. So I, I played just like three or four of these pieces at Fairchild Chapel. And I, they just were such good concert pieces that it, that's what hooked me. So I, on a, I was due for sabbatical and I got research status to, to look into Royer. And so that ended up, you know, for the first time sitting in libraries, looking at these wonderful findings on 18th century, you know, public uh, prints of, of harpsichord music and operas because Royer uh, had arranged, um, some of his pieces were actually arrangements from his operas, which were also not known. So I looked at those, now that, at that point in 1979 or whatever it was, um, there wasn't really much in the way of, a, of large Baroque orchestras. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like nobody could have played that score. I wanted to hear what those violins and flutes and bassoons and everything sounded like playing that music. And, you know, there wouldn't really be a, a place. There was starting to be. I'm trying to remember who who is who is the French conductor Malguar? Mm -hmm. was it Malguar? I mean, there, I think so. There there were some recordings of like Rameau operas and stuff that actually were using original instruments. Started to happen about then, and of course, 1987 was Atis, Lully's Atis, that Bill Christie did. So that's a huge decade there then from 70 nine to 89. I mean, a lot happened in that time. But anyway, I got hooked on just the whole, um, well, first keyboard music of, of Royer, which I did publish. And then, and then on a, on a later sabbatical or research status in 2000, much later, Catherine Tarosi had, I, I was going to look at those all those operas um because i was still thinking about them from from the time way before sure. that i had yeah. that i had found them and and catherine Tarosi came to do a residency at overland and baroque dance and she said well what are you going to do next year in this in this sabbatical and i said well i want to look at I want to look at Royer's music. And, and she said, well, play me some of the of some Royer. So I played her some of the pieces. And she said, well, if you find something, let's do it. Let's produce it. So I thought, hmm, okay, that changed my focus from a survey of the operas to let's find something to do. So anyway, I got a big grant from the Florence Gould Foundation, and we did uh, Royer's opera ballet, Le Pouvoir de l'Amour, um, which is 1743. Um, and she came and did the choreography. It was with sets. It was a big, I think 28 person Baroque band made up of Overland students and professionals, all who, of who had an Overland connection actually. Um, so that was, and then I did the critical edition after that, I think that's the main thing. I mean, I'm interested in the scholarly part, but I would not do an edition uh, unless there were a performance attached to it somehow. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 to me, it's too sterile. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's a perfect example of what scholarship is really for, isn't it? I mean, to bring it from to bring it from wherever it lies unattended to the attention of people right now. That's very cool. Yeah. It must be a source of great pride for you. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm and, still interested. Yeah, and now people are playing Hawaii. People play Hawaii pieces up and down oh, all the time now. All the time. I know. <laughs> They That's play the march, they play the march, and they play vertigo. Right. They all like vertigo. Mm -hmm. well, I think that Scythian march is everybody's favorite harpsichord piece it now, is, practically. It's so fun. And, it, and we have you to blame for it. It's sort of like it's sort of like the lady who invented Pockle Bell's cannon or something oh. like that. <laughs> anyway, so so Lisa, what do you think? I mean, times have changed. What do you what do you see in the uh, as you look around in the historical performance field now and in the future? What kind of what kind of, what is your, what do you see in your crystal ball? Oh dear, <laughs> I don't have one. Um, yeah, I suppose I should have thought about this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I all I can really speak about is the two places where I am still seeing students and seeing people that that are excited about this and want to do it uh it's it's fascinating to teach at eastman um because the energy in the early music part of the school is coming i mean paul odette has been there and crystal thielman for for many years and they've had this wonderful um, ensemble program that they run and tons of Eastman grads have had the benefit of working with them and that's great but I think I think what they said is that it's just been in recent years that all of a sudden there's been this kind of explosion of interest in uh, both vocal and instrumental uh, Baroque performance from the students so it's coming from the students, sort of the pressure to do more to, um, I'd listened to the last week to their, they call it the Collegium, um, this Baroque performance uh, ensemble. And the instrumental group, which did Telemann's Don Quixote, was spectacularly good, oh. just amazing. And the singers in, you know, in these days, it's hard to work with singers because they had to be 12 feet apart and they had to mm. sing with masks and all that. But there are so many singers at Eastman who want to learn this and Paul knows how to do it. He last year did the whole um, Carnival de Venise of Campra. Um, as the, as the piece that they did, which meant that all 17 voice majors were in that and they all learned French style in one semester. Um, and they were super excited about it. Um, part of that is because of things like the Boston Early Music Festival productions of Baroque opera, mm -hmm. which, uh, or in fact, any productions of Baroque opera, even whether it's concert version or stage, and whether it's here or in Europe, but I mean, there's there's enough that voice students now think of this as something that's if they're in, if they get hooked and they're interested, it's it's viable. It's something that they can do. That's enormously but, important, isn't it? Yeah, the, the singer oh, should want to do it. Oh, absolutely. And um, right now, there is a singer at Eastman who's a master's student, and she is getting her her degree for this is a first <laughs> will be in early music voice i mean she came in as a voice major but she's mm -hmm. you know, this is what she wants to do so she'll be studying so it. you see the future as being supported by a wave of incoming people who want to perform want to perform this music i think there is definitely that and i think that um yeah also at, at BPI, although last year was kind of hard to tell because it's virtual, but <laughs> but there are there are that was a really large harpsichord class, and I think you may have heard from the other Oberlin Baroque Performance Institute people that that it's amazing that every year there are high school students who are interested in coming and who are good, and that. The, and the things keep growing rather than getting smaller. I, 
you know, I think there was a lot of sort of doom and gloom about early music movement and it's all dying and all that. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see that. I, I don't know, but you asked about a crystal ball and I don't even know what I think would be the ideal thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. I, and I'm sure that this has been talked about too. I think the danger is, I mean, you started by saying that some that students don't have a necessarily a, a very good idea of why sort of the, the modern history of what they're doing. Um, and I think that the, I think the danger is that you want the students still to be asking questions. You want them to be basically intellectually curious about what they do. I mean, mm -hmm. that is, I think that's an integral part of, of going into this field. You don't want them just to be, okay, I've, I've learned how to sing this style and I'm going to go audition for all these parts and do it. And that's what I'm, I mean, although, I mean, that's good too, but you hope that people are, it's that spark of, of combination of, um, sure, performing, but also asking questions and being creative and filling in the blanks that we don't know um, with your imagination. Um, that's, that's a wonderful, maybe a definition of what sets historical performance apart. I mean, it, that it's some kind of responsible, responsible music making that has to do with uh, uh, taking the music on its own terms and taking it seriously. Something like that. Well, I hope I hope that'll be a good model for the future, and I hope that this increasing number of incoming people will mean that there will be a big demand for the people who are looking to go out and make a career, make a career out of out of performing this music. They're gonna yeah. if there are more and more people wanting to perform it, there must also be more and more people wanting to hear it, and that's the good news for the young professional, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I was just thinking about a number of my students who are out there and sort of creating their own little centers of early music. I mean, um, lots of them. Well, I mean, some, it's not even creating now, but have created, obviously, uh -huh. Jeanette Sorrell has done this amazing thing in Cleveland with the Paul's Fire. And then um, an, another person who is, I don't think is organized, has been the center of organization, but has been in a group of early musicians in Southern California <clears throat> is Ian Pritchard, who's yeah. a wonderful player and, and his wife is a cornetist. And so there they are. And so there's a, a circle there. It's like every almost every one of these students who has continued with harpsichord is, is in a little circle that has something going on. So maybe one, one model for the future is go somewhere and create something. That's right. Yep. You, have to, you have to have a little bit of that kind of energy to do it. I mean, yeah. a little entrepreneurial, um, maybe more than a little entrepreneurial um, energy, uh, but yeah. That. Well, I'm 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 glad to hear a sort of positive and optimistic outlook, Lisa. I share it with you, but maybe not everybody does. But I think I th I think we're both right, and all the doomsayers are all <laughs> wrong. Thank you so much for your insights and your wisdom. I don't know if you have any parting remarks for us, but it's been a it's been a pleasure to touch base with you and to think back over such a long time together. Yeah, it's been great. Thank well, you. so thank you very, very much. We're delighted to have this conversation and my, my sincere thanks to my friend, Lisa Good Crawford. Thank you, Lisa.